Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We are in a series of messages that are addressing the values of our church. And you know, values are those things that uh, tell people who we are as a church, what we hold as important, the shared convictions that we have as a church. And uh, we've gone through several of these values already, and uh, some of them are actual, uh, and some of them are uh, aspira- really all of them are aspirational in one sense, and that we want to see these values growing more and more in our church. Uh, but some of them are, are maybe less actual than others. And so far, we've had several that you've had living authentically, right? And uh, connecting intentionally, uh, proclaiming graciously the gospel. You know, all of those, the labels alone are pretty intuitive. Now, last week, Ransom, he had the unintuitive label, multiplying concentrically. I mean, what? That's a little bit harder to understand at face value. And I'm going to blame that on the engineering part of the visioning team. Okay, they came up with the complicated, no, no. We, we, deliberately, we deliberately knew going in that, that that label may be a little bit, huh, what does that mean? And we want that question. We want to be able to talk about what it means to multiply in concentric circles in our lives and in our church and in neighborhood. Well, this morning's uh, value, uh, you actually have felt it in numerous ways already. It, it, it shows up in our our mission statement. This morning we're looking at the value of caring genuinely. And our mission statement says that we are all about bringing gospel restoration to people's deepest needs in our broken world. And this value of caring genuinely, you hear that language in our mission statement. Here's what we mean by caring genuinely. In a world of apathy and selfishness, we care for the deepest needs of people. So you've been hearing this already, this value already through our mission statement, and it really, we believe, reflects who we are as a church. You know, I've been reading this Advent season through the Gospel of Luke as part of my uh, personal quiet time. And, and I think it's around Luke chapter 9, it was in Luke chapter 9, that you know, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and they have the Mount of Transfiguration, and you know, he is exchanged in glory, and Peter makes his boneheaded statement, and you know, all that happens, this wonderful mountaintop experience occurs, and then they come back down, and now real life intervenes, and things, they begin to have issues. And in that chapter, after the Mount of Transfiguration, you see the disciples arguing among themselves as to who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And they were jockeying for positions of power. And Jesus heard what they were saying. And the the scriptures say this, now came an argument among them as to which of them would be greatest in the coming kingdom. But Jesus knew their thoughts. So he stood a little child beside him and said to them, anyone who takes care of a little child like this is caring for me. And whoever cares for me is caring for God who sent me. Now read the last sentence out loud with me, ready? Your care for others is the measure of your greatness. Your care for others is the measure of your greatness. You know, I've been a part of churches that unfortunately completely ignored this aspect of the gospel. But I've also been a member of churches that took this extremely serious, this call to love and care for one another in a genuine matter. It was a part of who that church was. And I'll tell you that today, between those two types of churches, the ones that left an indelible imprint on my life are those churches who took this call of the gospel very seriously. So for me, this value is very, very personal. So is this aspirational or is it actual for our church? Obviously, we want it to become more and more of who we are, but 
we did not have to debate this value at all in the team. We looked at our church, and this was one that we just felt like, this is part of the fabric of our church, of caring genuinely. I believe this value reflects who we are, and because of this, it is naturally and organically expressing itself in different ways and in new ways as different situations arise within our body and also out in the community. And I love this about our church. I just love the fact that we, we enter into each other's lives and we care for one another. But this morning, I want us to, to be careful and to take some time to be very careful with this and, and to look at, uh, a, a, I guess, a possible downfall. Um, if we're not careful, this value can become a matter of spiritual pride. And so our care, and this is what I want, let's, let's just read it out loud. Our care for others has to be motivated and shaped by God's love for us. If we don't keep our care centered, and structured, and framed in this way, our care will either become a legalistic activity on the one hand, or it will become a watered down form of the social gospel on the other. If we don't keep our care constrained and shaped and centered on the, the love that God has for us and how he's cared for us, then we will go to one of those two extremes in our care for other people. If our care isn't motivated and shaped by biblical passages like this one that we're looking at this morning, spiritual pride will set in and our care will not be genuine at all. It'll be self-centered, self-seeking, and it, does, it will not honor God. So this, so this morning, I want us to dig into this text, which says so much about God's love for us and how he cares for us. And we're going to see three gospel truths here this morning that I want us to kind of focus in on. First of all, the first gospel truth is that God reveals himself in the way that he has cared for us. Verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now stop right there. Beloved, John is writing to other Christians who are in this church, and that's that phrase, beloved, and one another. So he's talking about, let us make sure that as followers of Christ, we are loving the other followers of Christ in the body of Christ and in an appropriate manner. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now let's remember this morning that John, in writing this book, is writing to a church that is struggling with the heresy of Gnosticism. And the Gnostics perverted the idea of God and how he interacts with humanity and also who Jesus himself was. So John is making a critical point here. He says, if we love the brethren with God's love, this is possible only because we have been born again and we know God. The only way we can love people and one another the way God loves us is if first he has regenerated us, he has turned us into a new creation through his grace. And by doing this, not only can we love one another the way God loves us, but we can also know God. Godly love for one another, which is expressed practically through genuine care, is an indispensable indicator of eternal life. Let me put it a different way. Maybe let me put it a negative way. Neg state it negatively. If you do not love and genuinely care for your brothers and sisters in Christ, this means that you are not a believer. This means that you're pretending that you've never been born from above. That's how indispensable this is. At the end of verse 8, we have one of those phrases. A phrase that everybody seems to know, even if you're you know, not a believer. Have you ever had those kind of conversations with people? Maybe they, they never darken the door of the church, but they, you, know, you have a, a discussion with them and they throw out Bible phrases at you, like you know, the most infamous one is, oh, uh, well, well, judge not, lest you be judged. You ever had that one thrown at you? Well, another one that is very well known in the, the non-Christian world and come, becomes a source of misunderstanding is here in verse eight. 
Anyone who does not love does not know God because, and here it is, God is what? Love. Because God is love. And this is the high point in a book, in this book, where John has been saying significant things about God. The Gnostics, like the cults of today and the false religions of today, they pervert the meaning of God and who God is and form God into into a human image. And so John has been saying important things about God and who he is throughout this book. All the way back in chapter one, verse five, he says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In chapter two, he says this, if you know that he is righteous, so God is not just light, God is also righteous. You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And and of course, John is also the author of the gospel. And this letter that goes to these churches, his gospel went to, and he says something profound in John chapter four, Jesus is speaking, and John captures these words for us when Jesus says that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then, of course, John was a Jew. And, the, and his understanding of God was obviously greatly shaped by the Old Testament, which tells us much about who God is and his nature. Most, most significantly, Leviticus chapter 11, where God says, I am Yahweh, and I am your God, and you are my people. And just as I am holy, you should be holy. So God is holy, he is light, he is righteous. And then in this book, the culminating point of this entire book, the pivotal point, is here in verse eight, this little phrase, God is love. God is love. John is telling this church this incredible truth about God in order to recalibrate their thinking. See, God... God never does anything that is opposite of who he is. God does nothing that will violate who he is. So everything that God does is holy. Everything that God does is righteous. Everything that God does is light. Everything that God does is loving. When he creates, when he judges, when he sustains us, when he answers prayer with yes, no, or not yet, when he sanctifies us, when he chastises us and disciplines us, when he takes us to glory or takes someone we know to glory, he loves perfectly because God is love. And everything he does will never violate who he is. Warren Wearsby is someone that I have loved since I was a teenager. And he he writes, it has accurately been said that love does not define God, but God defines love. God is love and God is light. Therefore, his love is a holy love, and his holiness is expressed in love. All that God does expresses all that God is. And the greatest thing that God has done is what we celebrate this time of the year. Jesus sent into the world in the incarnation where God himself takes on the human flesh, born as a baby, Why? So that he could live the life that we were called to live, perfectly obeying God's law in every manner and in every way, and ultimately giving his life for our sins. You shall call his name Jesus, Joseph is told by the angels, for he shall take away the sins of his people. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God has revealed himself, and he continues to reveal himself, and the way that he loves and he cares for us. Second gospel truth, Jesus is the perfect revelation of God's genuine love and care. Verse nine, in this, 
The love of God was made manifest among us. That word manifest is phanero. It's an important word. It, it means to reveal, to make known, to show or discla- disclose in a way so that something becomes public knowledge. In this, the love of God has become public knowledge among us. Now, what's the this? that he refers to, the second word of that. In this is how God has made himself known. Read on in the verse. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, verse 10 says, what's the this? It's God sending Jesus into the world. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In one person, Jesus, in one person, God tells us everything he wants to say about himself. Everything he wants to say about himself, God says in one person, Jesus Christ. And what he says is completely contradictory to what the ancient world, what Gnosticism, what the false religions of the ancient world and the false religions of our day say about God is totally opposite. You see, in the, in the religions of the ancient world, Greece and Rome and Egypt and the Middle East and the philosophies of Athens and Rome, in, in the religions of the world today, look at them very carefully and their concept of God. You will see that their concept of God has something very much in common. God is not love. God is someone who we have to appease through our good works. You see, in the ancient religions at this time, God was seen as, or the gods, if it was plural, the God or gods were seen as very aloof. They were absolute and they were aloof and they were passionless, not passionate. They were passionless towards humanity. And if there was any love attached to religious thought, religious love came from humans who were craving a relationship with the creator, the divine, and so out of acts of love and wanting that kind of communion, works were done. Sacrifices and prayers and all the things that were associated with the false religions were offered up in order to have some kind of a relationship that the human wants towards God. Love was the human responsibility. We were to love God and appease him through our works. This is the message of religions all around the world, but Christianity is different. The way God has revealed himself in the scriptures, in this passage, God says, this isn't who I am at all. I am love, and I prove it. How does he prove it? He proves it by taking the initiative and sending his beloved son, Jesus, into the world. Think about that for a moment. For all of eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit coexist in a perfect love relationship. God the Father perfectly loves the Son and the Spirit, and the Son perfectly loves the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit perfectly loves the Father and the Son, and this triune Godhead loves one another perfectly. They don't need us yet. This triune God moves toward us. God takes the initiative and he enters into our world sending his beloved, unique, one of a kind son so that his, our sins could be redeemed, we could be redeemed. This says something important. When John says, love one another, our model for what it means to love one another is what we see happening here with God. God takes the initiative, he approaches us. We don't approach him. Humans love our sin, we love our sin. We hide from God like Adam and Eve in the garden. We run from God. 
We don't seek reconciliation with God. God seeks the reconciliation with us. And he initiates this, and he enters into our world, and he pays the price so that his holiness and his justice can be satisfied and our sins can be atoned for. He does all of this. Why? Because God is what? Love. Love. And so for us to love one another and to care genuinely for one another, it means, it means sending our very best. It means spending and giving of our, of our best resources for the good of someone else. And that means that genuine care will always cost us something. It will always cost us something. If our care does not cost us something, it's convenient care. It's the care that comes from spiritual pride. It's the care that is done so that we feel better about ourselves. It's self-centered. But genuine care always costs us something. First truth, God has revealed himself, and he reveals himself and the way that he cares for us. Second truth, Jesus is the perfect revelation of genuine love and care. One final gospel truth this morning. Our genuine love and care for one another makes God real to other people. Verse 11 and 12 say something extremely significant in a passage that's already said some weighty things. But it says something about us and why genuine care is so important. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, right? No, we can't see God because God is spirit. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected. An important word, his love comes to completion. His love finds its ultimate fulfillment. His love is made known in us. Something significant that's being said here. God is saying, listen, as important as the incarnation and the death and burial of Jesus Christ is, I'm not done yet. The completion of this entire story of redemption is found when we love and genuinely care for one another. For in that loving care, God is revealed to people who cannot see him, who do not know him. You know, I, I realized uh, uh, this week that it was 20 years ago that Catherine and I had walked into a, a PCA church similar to this one. And we had been attending for a few months. And uh, one morning, uh, Catherine was checking our son, uh, uh, MJ. He went by Little Jerry at the time. Uh, he, 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 she was checking Little Jerry into the nursery. She was pregnant with Jacob. And, and she had struck up a relationship with one of the children's ministry uh, volunteers. Her name was Joy Haynes. And they would talk, and, and we had been to Joy's house, and uh, and, and the kids had played together, that type of thing. She was a single mom. And in that conversation one Sunday morning, she, Catherine mentioned that when Joy asked how she was doing, she said, just tough, and, and she explained that Jerry was about to go in for a major surgery, and as a result, he was gonna be in a body cast for like six months. And from here all the way down to his knees, and his legs had to be spread-eagled like this, you know, out at a, at a deep angle as his, they were constructing hips for him. And uh, Joy, you know, took that information. Unbeknownst to us, she took that to the church leadership. We'd only been attending the church for a few months. And she explained to the church leadership what was going on, and before we know it, we got a call from the head of the Mercy Team in that church, a Mercy Team similar to what we have here in our church, where the deacons and others volunteer and do work. 
And so we understand that you're going to be going through this procedure. We want to help you during this time because it's obviously going to be very intensive. I worked. Catherine was at home all day by herself with, uh, with Jerry. And so the bulk of this burden was going to end up falling on her. And so before we knew it, Joy was made the point of contact, the one single person, so we didn't get inundated by all the volunteers. And she scheduled everything. And 90 people in this church signed up to help care for us over the next six months. And listen, care here, loving and caring for us wasn't just a telephone call that says, hey, I love you, man. Hope everything goes okay. Now, it's important to be told that you're loved, but what was more important was when they would show up at the house and say, Catherine, why don't you get out of here and go relax and have a good time, which meant she went shopping, right? (laughs) Or, uh, Or they would come and they would help clean the house. Um, they realized that, you know, it's, it was difficult on her, uh, and, and we'd have to get neighbors to help. We had a little Honda Civic. Well, have you ever tried to put a kid in a full body cast with their legs like this into the back of a Honda Civic? You know, you got to turn him on his side and scoot him in and move the seats back. <laughs> you remember what that was like? You know, you'd move the seats back so he wouldn't fall over on his face when you hit the brakes too hard, you know, that type of thing. And they realized that this is not good, right? Well, we didn't have a better vehicle. And so, you know, a, a, a van was lined up and ramp was made for the van and, uh, you know, wheelchairs so that he could be wheeled up and he could just be gotten back and forth to doctors. I mean, just practical needs were met. And this is what happened. And yes, they prayed with us and they ministered to us and they loved us. But, you know, neighbors and then, and, the street that we were on began to see this. Family members, friends from other parts of Jacksonville, even from further south, saw how this church responded to our need, and that was such a compelling example of God's love that they said, I want to be a part of a church like that. Because this is very rare in many churches today. And this is one of the reasons why I love our church. I believe that genuine care, it is a part of who we are. And and for quite some time, it's been evident within our small groups. And how within our small groups, we care for one another. And when we're going through different situations, people in the small group pick up the slack. This is why it's important if you're not in a discipleship group, the front lines for our care in our church comes through our small groups. You see, the, the pastors cannot care for you. It's too many people. We cannot bring the level of care that is needed. And not only that, that's not the job of a pastor. The job of the pastors is to equip the saints of the church to do the work of the ministry. And that starts with caring for one another in practical ways. And so for quite some time, this has been happening in our small groups. But you know, we have seen that there are needs in our church that are way beyond the scope and the ability of our small groups. And so what did we see arise? And, and this has arisen because there is a culture of care in this church, which is what I love, one of the many things I love about our church. And so many of you stepped up and you started this thing called Stephen Ministry. And it's now volunteer-led. And there's been a call for more training and more volunteers because the needs are great. Needs that are greater than what a single small group can take care of. And then as this living authentic value has come into our church, you've been stepping forward and people have been stepping forward and saying, hey, I have this this bondage in my life, this addiction in my life. I have these wounds in my life and I need help. And again, recovery ministries have started to address these needs, these hurts in our church. And some of these needs and hurts are so deep. Let me tell you something. I love the fact that our mercy fund never runs out of money. It's like the, it's like the widow's oil in the Old Testament with Elijah, right? You remember that story? You'd pour, uh, the, the widow would pour out the oil for the day, and then when she came back the next day, the oil was there. Every time we draw down the balance in our mercy fund, it gets filled back up. And I want you to know something. 
this money is being administered by our deacons in a wonderful way. And there are people sitting here among you right now. That mercy fund is making it possible for them to get the help that they need. Because sometimes our wounds are so deep. Sometimes there are things in our past that a small group can't handle and a recovery ministry can't handle. And so we've partnered with Christian counselors and that money is helping people in our church get the healing that they need. And that's possible because genuine care means that we give our best and we spend our resources and we put our money and our time and our talent and our treasures where our mouth is. And thank you because I think our church, we get this, we see this. And through our friendships with one another and people walking across the street or walking across the office, this value to me, this is actual in our church. Now, do we want it to become more? Of course we do. We want it to become more and more of who we are in this church so that people who are not within our body as they see and they seek help, they find out that there is a place on Emerson Drive that takes seriously this idea of caring for one another. And I hope that all of you, as you volunteer in family ministries, for example, like Joy Haynes, a volunteer in family ministries, checking our child into nursery, understood that her ministry was more than babysitting. That, that her ministry was interacting with the, her brothers and sisters in Christ. And when the need arose and it became obvious within that sphere of ministry, she escalated it. She cared enough about us to say, to do something more than, well, I hope that works out for you. I'll pray for you. And that's not to denigrate prayer. We, we need the prayers. We're going to talk about that next week. But Jesus calls on us to be the hands and feet also of our prayers. To be the hands and feet of him and his joy and his, or of his grace. And so whether you are in family ministry or you're ministering through your small group or through the mercy team or through some other ministry of our church, I hope that you always link it back to this most important truth that's in this verse. And all these types of situations... The God who is love, who expressed that love by sending Jesus, is now bringing that entire sacrifice to completion. And how is he bringing it to completion? By revealing himself through our love and care of one another. That's how important it is. Caring genuinely is an indispensable value. It says that you've been born of God. It says that you know God. And it reveals God to people who don't yet know him or people who know him but need to experience his presence in some of the toughest times of life. May this value continue to define us as a church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you We thank you because this value in our church has come about because of your grace. It's come about because of your work in our lives. Lord, I pray that it would continue to grow, that it would continue to define us as a church. You tell us, Lord Jesus, that it is how we love one another that all men will know that we are your disciples. So before we do anything else, before we plant churches, before we send out missionaries and church planters, may we do those most important things first, which is love one another and care for one another the way you have loved and cared for us. And may that love for you and for one another shape our church planting and our evangelism and our outreach, and our discipleship. Lord Jesus, continue to give us the grace we need so that we will love and care for one another well and thus reveal you to the world around us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.